Good morning. It's been a little while since I've been up here. I don't remember when the last time was, but it's been a while. It's good to see how everyone looks from up here. For some reason, uh, you look different up here from up here than you do when I'm sitting down there. I don't know what makes that different, but uh, it's good to see uh, everyone who's here this morning. Uh, some new faces as well, and uh, some returning faces, and uh, some regular faces. So we have uh, a number of people here this morning. It's good to see you, good to be with you, and it's good to worship God together. Um, this morning, um, I want to take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23 to 33. And uh, before I get started, by way of announcement, those of you who have uh, smaller children, I don't know what the age group is, but uh, those of you who have children that would like to go to Children's Church, we have a team at the door who will be happy to uh, work with them. And, uh, uh-oh. They have something special planned for the younger kids this morning, so if you would like um, to let them go to that at this time, that would be good. All righty. Kids are so precious, aren't they? Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 10, 23 to 33. Um, there will be another passage we'll take a look at as well that's a little similar to this passage. But starting with uh, verse 23, All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. If someone says to you, that meat, this has been offered by, um, I'm getting my tongue tangled up here, this has been offered in sacrifice, or that, that meat has been offered to an idol, then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I don't mean your conscience, I mean his. Why should my liberty be, for why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that for which I gave thanks? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to the Jews, neither to the Greeks nor to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, in order that they might be saved. Let us uh, bow our heads a moment. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, we ask your blessing on your word. We ask that your Holy Spirit speak to us to apply your truth to all matters of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just as sort of a side note, I want you to know that the next verse that follows this passage relates to it, and it says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. That's Paul's statement to the Corinthian church. In other words, his life was a model of Christ-like living that they were to follow. And that was the, the, the thing he asked them to look to. They could never meet Jesus in the flesh because Jesus had already died and gone to heaven and resurrected and, and gone to heaven. But uh, for the Ephesian or the Corinthian church, they were going to have to look at other people to see what Christ-like behavior was. In our world today, that's us. People look at us to see what Christ-like behavior is. Another passage I want to read to you this morning comes from Colossians, another book Paul wrote. Colossians 3, 12 to 17 Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, and if someone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, as the Lord has forgiven you. 
so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and thankful, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts toward God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, this is where this passage is similar to the next one, the one we just read, I mean, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Here we have two passages talking about things that we might do or say and the consequence of what we do or say is to be related to God's glory or to be related to Jesus' name. We're Christians. Whatever we do or say reflects on God and Christ. I want us to keep that idea in our minds throughout the rest of uh, this morning's uh, talk. Uh, The people around us will look to us to find out what Christ-like is. Whatever we're doing and saying is what they're going to say, oh, that must be Christ-like. Or they're going to say, wait a minute, that's not Christ-like. And they're going to have some questions or some problems that come up. What does doing all we do for the glory of God mean? What, what does this mean, the God, uh, God's glory? And how does our deeds or our words relate to his glory? Um, what, what does doing what we do for God's glory entail? First of all, it entails a right attitude, a right motivation, and we use this to limit our Christian liberty. Let me explain. It's got more to do with how we do and say things rather than the specific things we do or say. It's got more to do with the how, the manner in which our speech and our actions come out of us. It also has more to do with the results in the lives of other people around us than what our initial intentions are when we begin our speech act or our deed, what results from it? Does it bring more glory to God or does it take away glory from God? Does it bring more honor to his name? Does it lift up the name of Jesus or does it not? And and these are things to think about when we think about our deeds and our statements. It's not so much how did it make me feel, it's what did it do in the lives of the people around me as I did this thing or as I said this thing. In the passages we read, there's no mention of specific deeds to perform or specific words to say to someone else. There's manners, there's attitudes and dispositions that are mentioned instead. Okay? This is because Paul has already laid out how Christians are to exercise liberty in what they do and what they have others do, what they require of others. This is not a path, Christianity is not a path of bondage to a specific list of customs or a set of specific practices. Every pagan religion has a list of rules that you do the pagan religion by. What Paul has said to Christians is that we are at liberty to do whatever it takes to get the gospel out there. However, the results are what's measured. What are the results of our actions and our words? With greater liberty, if you, we have this saying, uh, the, the more you're given, the more you're responsible for. Um, if we're given more liberty as Christians, then we're also more responsible for what we do with our, our liberty. Um, we now have the responsibility for the way our words and actions impact others around us. We have the responsibility for the way our words and actions bring glory to God. They either do or they don't. There's, sometimes it takes some skill and learning and maybe some maturity on our part to figure out whether they do or they don't, but they either do one or the other. They either lift up God or they make it harder for others to find him. When scripture says to do all things for God's glory, it goes beyond our intentions to do the right thing. It goes to the results of our speech and our actions. What did our speech cause inside the other person What did our actions say to them about God and his nature? We are responsible for the results and not only our intentions. Did our speech glorify God or put mud on his name? Did our actions 
lift up the name of Christ or self? What, what, did, what, what happened as a result? Did, did our actions lift up his kingdom or our own? We often like to hide the, behind the phrase, I didn't mean to do it. And there's many number of things we might do that we didn't mean to do, or we might say that we didn't mean to say. However, whether we meant to or not, we note the result, we realize that's not what should have happened, and we make amends, we make restitution for our actions, we seek the forgiveness of the other party, and so forth. Uh, this happens all the time in our interpersonal relationships. We say something we didn't mean, and then we say, you know what, I didn't mean to say that, let me rephrase that, or something like that, okay? Um, whether we meant to do it or not, if we caused harm, then we have something to fix. I didn't mean to bring dishonor to God, won't get us around, do all for the glory of God. We still have that as a responsibility to do whatever we choose to do for God's glory. These passages get to the nitty-gritty of our lives in a way that giving out a list of rules doesn't. Imagine that you were given a list of rules to follow. You could keep all the rules and yet at the same time look for places that the rules don't cover. Anybody done that before with a list of rules and say, well, they didn't say that, and completely violate the spirit of the list of rules. A list of rules about safety in the workplace. They give you 10 things to be safe about. Well, they didn't mention this one, and I thought of it, so I'm not going to be safe on that one. Well, you just violated the whole purpose of the list, okay? It's easy for people to do this. We all know people do this. We often have done that as well in various lists of rules in our lives, whether that was a list of behavior in the classroom rules or whether that was a list of uh, ways to conduct business at work. Oftentimes, our human minds are looking for a loophole, okay? There's a lot of loopholes in federal laws and regulations and tax codes and various things like that. Uh, and, and nobody's fond of taxes. I don't mean to pick on you if you don't like taxes. We're not fond of those things, and I understand that. But lists of rules always have things somebody didn't think about, and we can find that loophole. But this kind of statement doesn't have a loophole. Do all to God's glory. Everything you say or do, do it to God's glory. You can look through the whole Bible and come up with a list of what Christians should do and they shouldn't do, and it'll have loopholes because it's a list. But when the results are what's measured instead of the quality of the deed, then it's harder to have loopholes. Does it result in the thing it's supposed to result in or not? Does it lift up God's glory or does it lift up something else? It's a little bit harder to find loopholes in that. You could keep all the rules and at the same time go against the very list every time you found a loophole in the system. Basically, you could subvert the power of the list by going contrary to the spirit. When scripture says to do all for God's glory, it includes things that are on people's lists, and I don't mean every person's list, but good, well-meaning people often create lists. It includes things on lists, and maybe I should rephrase that to biblical list. It includes those things, but it includes things that aren't mentioned in Scripture as well. Uh, it includes things that can bring glory to God or can fail to bring glory to God, no matter what they are. We often like to list by, live by list because lists are easy to live by. We, we think that's not true, but we do it. Because the sooner we make a list and start living by the list, we stop thinking. A list is a way to, 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 to eliminate the, the need to think about what should be on the list to do and what shouldn't be. For example, when I go to the grocery store, I make a list so that when I'm in the grocery store, I don't have to think about what do I need. Because if I have to think about it there, I'm not going to think about it. Okay? So a list helps me do certain tasks, but at the same time, once I make the list, I don't have to think about that anymore. All I have to do is pull out the list and read it. Well, a lot of times we live our lives by lists. And it's because we don't want to think about how our actions or our words impact someone else. In other words, one of the things this passage is bringing out to us is you don't have to have a rule book to live as a Christian. It's not necessary to have a rule book. You need to look at the results. Does it bring honor and glory to God or does it not? 
If it does, then it's a wholly unacceptable thing. If it doesn't, we probably need to reflect on life and our, our lives and make some changes. Your actions and words either glorify him or they glorify someone or something else. On one hand, there's liberty outside the rule book. On the other hand, we need to restrict our own liberty by ensuring that whatever we do or say does bring glory to God. Sometimes we like rules because we like to see where the boundaries of limits to these things are because unlimited rules are annoying, okay? We like to see, oh, there's a list and it's only 25 long. I can handle that, okay, or whatever the case is. In the Army, we had lists of rules for every kind of thing we might do. And it was helpful because you didn't have to think about what do you need to do in this situation or that. You had this list memorized, you knew what to do, that kind of thing. And it's a very helpful tool. But in life, life is more complicated than what our list can handle. If we're not looking at the results of our actions and words and trying to figure out how we could have done or said that better, then we're missing a huge opportunity to glorify God and to bring honor to Jesus' name. Lists of rules put us in a way of automatic thinking where we are not focused on how our actions affect others. These passages get around that way of thinking and put the responsibility back on us to make sure our actions and words bring honor and glory to God. Why does this matter? Well, first of all, in both of these passages, the, the focus was on others. It isn't how I make my own life better, it's how I impact others around me, wherever they might be, okay? Especially to those who don't yet believe. There's a reason why we put on Christ-like behavior and learn to imitate Christ is so that others who don't believe will find what a wonderful Christian we are and a wonderful representative of Christ that we are and come get to know us and eventually get to know Christ. That's the normal pattern that most people come to Christ under. Verse, uh, verse, chapter 10, verse 29, in the first passage we read, I don't mean your conscience, but his. And, and this is where Paul is saying it's not your conscience about eating this kind of meat or that kind of meat. That's what I'm worried about. It's the conscience of the person out next to you. It's what example you set for others. And then in verse 32, he says, Give no offense to the Jews or the Greeks, neither to the church of God. Well, it's possible for our actions and words to bring offense and cause someone else to stumble. And, and this is why thoughts about our actions and, and uh, words matter. Paul's main concern throughout all his letters is that Christians everywhere do not do the things that keeps the gospel from spreading everywhere they go. If it stops the flow of spreading the gospel, it's a problem. Okay. Not to bring offense to the gospel, keep everything of good reputation. Paul is concerned how the, the non-believing Jews perceive Christianity. If they don't think Christians are living in a holy manner, they already have the Torah to guide them to live a holy life. If Christians aren't ma maintaining some kind of holy life that resembles what the, what the uh, Jews are already familiar with, they're not going to follow. And the pagans even have some levels of morality in their own cultures and in their own religions, and they're not going to follow either if Christians are, are worse than they are. Okay? That, that's just a couple of cases in point. If either of them perceive Christians to be flakes or fakes, they will not come to Christ to have their sins forgiven. Paul is also concerned about how the actions and words of Christians affect the church as a whole. Not, not only the unbelievers, but the church is also mentioned. How do they affect others at church? If Christians bring a bad reputation to Christianity, to the gospel, and to God, then many who are in the church might leave, or they might, quote-unquote, backslide. That's a possibility. Does your speech bring others to Christ, or does it chase them away? Does it, have, does it allow them to keep their distance? Does your actions around sinners make them want to know Jesus or be glad they don't? When you visit other Christians, do they want to grow in Christ or are they glad that you're one of those other Christians they can leave alone? Does it make them want to quit? Our actions and words have an effect on people that matters. We need to be sure that we do all for the glory of God. If you don't believe 
that this affects the church or you don't see how it affects the church, I want you to consider a national survey that was done of people who quit going to church. The top 10 reasons were given why people no longer go to a specific church or perhaps no longer go to church at all. They didn't separate the study into people who just quit going to a specific church from those who quit going to church in general. They interviewed everybody that they could get a hold of that quit for one of those two situations. Um, I'm going to take them in order from 10 and work my way up to 1. Okay, so the, the 10th most popular reason was this. They didn't find community there. Church sucked the life out of them. Shouldn't happen, right? God is the giver of life. He's the giver of community. His very presence is an epitome of community. Three in one. And yet people came to a church somewhere in our nation and left because there was no community. Ninth most popular reason, there was too much drama. Backstabbing, gossip, and they were pushed to the edge of their sanity. Now, that's not a healing community. They weren't living out Christ in that church, whichever one that might have been. Unresolved conflict. They had an issue with somebody there, and it didn't get resolved, and they left. A controlling personality. Clicks. They were not appreciated for who they were. They were being told how to vote. Number three, they were exposed to fake Christians. Now, I've heard it said before as a general rule that, yes, if you go to church, you will find real Christians because real Christians go to church. But you're also very likely to find fake Christians because fake Christians can't not go to church. They got to go if they're going to keep up the fake thing. So they're going to be there too. So they're going to be uh, some, in, some of both in church. But they were exposed to fake Christians and they didn't find anything real. Number two reason, they were lonely at church. They didn't think they were included. That was the number one way they described being lonely. The number one reason why people quit going to church or a specific church is they couldn't find Jesus there. If the church was really Christ-like, the people would want to be there. These are the top 10 reasons why in the United States people quit going to a church or any and all churches that they tried. All 10 of these relate to our deeds and our words and how we example Christ and how we don't. What if the people in the above examples came to a church where Christians carefully practiced the idea of doing all for God's glory? Words and deeds. They would find community, first of all, because that brings glory to God. They would find fellowship and harmony. They would not find backstabbing or gossip or ill treatment because that doesn't bring glory to God. They would be healed rather than having unresolved conflicts. They would be allowed to be who they were. They would fit in because God accepts everyone. They would be allowed to let the gospel penetrate their minds and their hearts rather than being told what to do. They would find real Christians who were about Christ's mission. They wouldn't be lonely, and they would find Jesus. This is the difference between people who are living their lives to do toward God's glory and people who don't. We have examples of churches like both in our, in our nation. We, we do. Do whatever you do for God's glory. What areas matter? Do all to the glory of God. That word all doesn't leave anything out. It includes any action or word that affects someone either toward God or away from God. It includes any effect that brings glory to God or that fails to bring him that glory. I made a list. It's short. I don't like lists, but sometimes lists are necessary. I've made a short list of areas of life that tend to impact others. Speech. When your day goes wrong, do the things that come out of your mouth bring glory to God or Satan? What about when something you like breaks? What about when someone carelessly scratches your car? How does your speech change when the person you get, when the person who gets your food order wrong? How does your speech change? Does your attitude change, disposition? In what way does that change your speech? You can be upset and not say mean things. It's possible. Spending habits. Can someone, who, someone else who watches you buying stuff follow your example 
and come closer to Christ or not? Or they be unable to? Is there something about your spending that fails to bring God glory? Interacting with people, do others find it easier to glorify God after you visit them, or do they find it harder? Do your Facebook posts glorify God, or do they cause others to stumble? How do you handle disagreements with others and conflicts? Do, that, do those handlings bring glory to God, or do they make people wish they weren't a Christian? Possessions. Do the poor cry out in the streets while you enjoy luxury? Would your possessions prevent someone from wanting to come to Christ near you? Do they hinder somebody from glorifying God? Is there something you have that gets more glory and praise than God does? Just something to think about. Clothing. Do your clothes bring glory to God or someone else? Is His holiness lifted up by your choices or is something else put on that pedestal? Time. Can someone follow you in how you spend time and be better able to find God? Or would it drive them closer to self-serving or despair? Would it make them want to come to church or make them glad they don't? How do you spend time? Thoughts. Now remember, this is the one they can't see. I put it on the list because it affects all the others. They can't see what you're thinking. Others cannot know that. You know it, and it affects all of you, whatever you spend time thinking about. I don't mean a random thought that pops in your head. I mean things you spend time thinking about. Remember, no one can see this, but it affects all the other things they can see. Do the things you let your mind dwell on glorify God, or do they put down yourself, or do they put down others? Remember, God is uplifting and not downputting. Businesses. Does the way you run your business find glory for God or greed? While all this seems like a tall order to do all for the glory of God, this is the main way we draw others to Christ, is by doing all that we do for God's glory, doing all that we do in Jesus' name. Others see it, they watch our example, and they say, hey, I want what that person has. I want to come to Christ. If God's people do not glorify him, he will eventually stop blessing them so that they might find him again. It's one of the reasons why God stops the blessing flow. is so that we say, oops, something's wrong. Let me do a search. Find out what's going on. Glorify God in all that you do. If you're not glorifying him in some area of life, either an area I mentioned before, and this is the reason I don't like lists, or some area I didn't mention, go seek his help. His Holy Spirit is always there to point things out and point us into a better direction. Take a look at what your actions cause somebody else or what your words cause somebody else and say, God, I need help. This area of my life is causing others to not find you. Help me. Holy Spirit will help. Another way to put this, try this for the week. Instead of living by a list and thinking, oh, today I'm going to do these 40 things because this is what I do every Monday, and these 30 things on Tuesday, and these three things on Wednesday, whatever the list looks like, it doesn't matter. Instead of doing that for a week, I want you to say instead, take each situation that you have with another person, an interaction, something you said with them or something you did where they could see. It doesn't matter what it said doesn't matter what was done I want you to take a look at what happened and think about later how did that bring honor and glory to God and how and in what way was that done in Jesus' name just for a week make a list my actions my I know we have a lot of deeds that we do in a day and we have a lot of words we're going to run out of space to write all this stuff I know that take, take a few that stand out in your mind let's do that and look at how it brought glory to God, whether it did or it didn't. Write it down. The reason why is because we do so many things all day long and we say so many things all day long that we no longer have a clue what we've said or done. I don't know five minutes later what I've said and done most times. I got a lot going on, and you do too. But 
what I want you to do is take some stock in what you say, what you do, and how it affected somebody near you. And then make a list of how that could bring glory to God, how it didn't, how it did. You'd be surprised at what you find. Some of the things you don't think anything about bring wonderful glory to God. But you, you should know that. And the only way you'll find out is to take stock of your actions and words. The other thing is, is there's areas we slip up in that we don't know about. And it's constant. It's repetitive because we repeat life. We're, we're very repetitive creatures. We tend to do things that we do over and over. And sometimes just taking moment stock once lets us say, okay, you know what? That way of interacting is done. I'm going to find a better way. And then we make a change, and then it's better. And you only have to do that once to fix a repetitive thing. You don't have to do it over and over and over again to fix a repetitive problem. You just have to figure out what's wrong and change it, and it stops being a repetitive thing. Do that for a week. Find out what's going on with yourself. Find out how it brings glory to God, and just take notice of the various ways it does. You'll be blessed by it. I promise. Do everything for the glory of God. Thank you. You may stand.